Welcome to Getting Sketchy Live, brought to you by TheVirtualInstructor.com. And now, let's get sketchy. Hello there, everyone. Matt here with TheVirtualInstructor.com, and welcome to Getting Sketchy, which, of course, is the greatest live show on all of YouTube. What is Getting Sketchy, if you're not sure? Well, it's where either myself or my good friend and fellow artist and art teacher, Ashley Hurst, tries to create a drawing for you inside of 45 minutes. And we are at the end of season six or seven. I think this might be season seven? six. Okay. Maybe? Seven? Maybe You said seven last week. Oh, did I? Yeah. Okay. Then, it, then it's season seven. <laughs> There's been so many of them. Uh, we do 10 drawings in each season, and then we have a follow-up at the end of the season. And tonight is actually the 10th drawing in this season, and mm -hmm. Ashley is going to be doing the drawing tonight. But we call it getting sketchy because, you know, obviously we're going to be sketching around. But I'm pretty sketchy as a human being anyway. Um, Ashley, do you... I'm totally just, sketchy. I've been yeah. sketchy all my life. Well, you got to watch out for people like me. So there you go. There's <laughs> the name getting sketchy. Anyway, um, while we're live, of course, you can make comments and ask questions uh, mm -hmm. in the chat box. On draw YouTube. along with us, hopefully. Yeah, absolutely, draw along with us. Um, and they don't have to, the questions or comments that you make don't have to be about what we're doing tonight. They can be anything art related. So, this is a great opportunity to ask questions uh, that pertains to drawing or painting or even sculpture. Um, and we'll do our best mm -hmm. to answer those for you. Um, now, if you're brand new to the channel or if you haven't done so yet, make sure you subscribe to the channel and click on the notification bell. So you're notified when we upload new videos. I'm working on a, a, a really good video for you guys, and I wanted to have it come out yesterday, which was Tuesday, but it will come out next Tuesday. Um, and I'm not gonna reveal what it is yet, but it'll be on the channel next Tuesday. So make sure that you subscribe so that you get that video. I will tell you that next week is scheduled to be the last uh, episode in this series of Getting Sketchy, but we're gonna take a break next week. Uh, we're, I'm gonna be out of town, so uh, we will, do the last episode the following week after that. And okay. that's true for the live lessons too. And speaking of live lessons, if you do want to go deeper with your drawing and painting, which I would encourage you to do so, there's a membership program over at thevirtualinstructor.com, which is my website. Um, and we have a ton of drawing and painting courses over there. There is so much content there uh, that you could not you could not go through all the content content in a year. I guarantee you couldn't. If you played uh, it nonstop, right, maybe, right, maybe, uh, maybe, maybe you could get through it all. Uh, anyway, drawing and uh, drawing and painting lessons galore. Uh, we have courses on colored pencils, pen and ink, charcoal, graphite. Uh, you name it, it's covered there. Also, weekly live lessons, as I mentioned before, we do live lessons in series. So those drawings and paintings are more in depth. They're slower, unlike the getting sketchy, which is quick. Um, and there's a weekly video that comes out called the mm -hmm. Members Minute where I critique a, uh, a member's artwork. And there's a year-long curriculum for visual arts teachers as well. So if you want to learn more about the membership program, uh, there's a link in the description below. Everyone starts off with a free trial for seven days. And we have a monthly plan and a yearly plan to fit to anyone's budget mm -hmm. there. So if you want to check that out again, there is a link in the description below. If you want to check out three of the course videos and eBooks for free um, from just a, a few random courses, there's a link to do that. Uh, there's a link in the description below this video as well. You can go check it out as well. Whew, that's a lot of stuff to yeah, say. Yeah, you, right? you, you had a lot to talk about. Yeah, I got to say all those things, you know. Well, I've got a little to talk about, I guess. Yeah. So we'll, talk, we'll go over our materials, take a look at our reference. Um, but that's about it. We're about to start our drawing. I am going to be working in pastels. So if you have your pastels out, that's great. Or if you need to run and grab them, do that quickly. Or work in a different medium, colored pencils, or draw along with a pencil. Your work can be black and white, even if mine's in color. Yeah, absolutely. You can use any medium that you wish. Um, the most important thing, if you are drawing along, is that you're drawing. Because uh, that is a form of practice in drawing and painting or skills that anyone can learn and develop. But it does require some practice in order to get good at it. And that's what we're doing here. And we've been working with motifs this season. Um, a motif is a theme. And uh, my theme has been facial features and I have done all the facial features. And then last week I drew a face. Ashley's theme has been down on the farm and he's done a tractor, <laughs> a rooster, uh, what Let's else see if you can. Can't you remember? You were here. I, my memory's so terrible. Okay, the other two. Wait, 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 wait. Rooster. Yep, that's right. Tractor. Mm hmm. Mm. Sheep. Sheep, that's right. Yeah. It's so random. You know, it's <laughs> it's down on the farm, but the things are still. It can random. be almost anything. Yeah. There's okay, a, I'm missing one. There's a, it's another animal. 
Mm-hmm. It's another animal. Oh, the horse. That horse, right. horse. Used to yeah. be a beast of burden, so right. not so much anymore. Not the pizza burden. It's the beast of burden. Beast of burden, not pizza what burden. Be your pizza burden. <laughs> Gosh, my pizza's burning. <laughs> anyway, uh, let's get into this one. So we'll go ahead and switch over. Alrighty, there we you can see our reference on the left and my paper here on the right. I'm gonna have to apologize. My hands are already a little bit dirty because oh, let me I've been. Real quick. I'm sorry. Oh, sure. Go uh, ahead. The reference photo. If you want a copy of the reference photo for yourself to follow along, if you go to the YouTube channel, if you click on my face, it'll take you to the YouTube channel and click on the community tab, and you'll see that photo reference there. It'll be up during the broadcast tonight. But if you want to go back and revisit it, there it is. All right. Sorry about that. Oh no, that's important. If you didn't uh, say where the reference was, then. Uh, uh, we'd have to answer that question after the fact. And we don't want you guys to get a late start. We want you to be able to start um, start with me and see how you do in 45 minutes, too. These time-drawing exercises are really valuable to the development of our artistic skills. Uh, so anyway, um, I'm going to be working on this gray paper. It is Mitant's paper, and I'm working on the slightly smoother side. If you happen to have Mitant's paper, it doesn't have to be the same color. I just wanted some sort of a medium-toned surface so that I could recognize the lighter and the darker marks off of that mid-tone, um, you know, even from the very beginning of the drawing. So any tone surface would be similar. Um, and uh, like I said, the surface is relatively smooth. It's the smoother side, but still suitable for pastel. I'm going to be using new pastels. And there's a few missing because I've already picked them out as colors that I plan to use. But uh, I also have some soft pastels by Windsor Newton. These are the half sticks. They're pretty reasonably priced if you, uh, if you, you know, you need 24 colors, but you don't want to spend as much. You can get the half sticks. And again, I've already picked out a couple of colors that I plan to use. Um, I've got them in the tray, the lid of my Winter Newton box, both new pastels and a couple of soft pastels. And as I choose more colors, I'll just keep them in this box so that I can find them again. Now, those pastels you just showed a few minutes ago, they definitely didn't look new. They, they right. look like old right. pastels. They're, they're new to me pastels. No, they're <laughs> they're used new pastels. Uh, new no, is in N U. Right, right. Not N E W. Right. It's a uh, type of pastel, and it's yeah. actually kind of. I guess you'd consider them to be hard pastels. Yeah. Let me let me go ahead and show you the box pastels. lid. If you're not familiar with these, these are um, Prismacolor new pastels, and they're harder. And uh, the theory is. You know, the intention is that we start with a harder pastel, and then as the as the pastel really starts to fill the tooth of the page, um, we switch to a softer pastel so we can continue to layer. So I'm going to do that for the most part, but there's some colors that are um, available in my small soft pastel set that I may need from the very beginning. But generally, I'm going to try to start with the new pastels and switch over to some of the soft pastels. Now, I'll also have some pastel pencils that are so-so. I mean, the new pastels are a fantastic material, and the Windsor Newton brand soft pastels are also fantastic artist quality um, you know, materials. These are General's mm-hmm. Pastel Chalk pencils, and they're so-so, um, but they do give us a little bit of extra control because they are, you know, you can sharpen them to a point. So I plan to use those a little bit in the artwork. Now, you can see in the reference, there's a lot of texture in here, just texture everywhere. Um, I'm going to pretty much ignore the texture of the background for the most part, just thinking about the colors back there, or really the values. The values are more important to me in the background or the negative space than the colors are. And uh, But I do plan to work up the texture on the avocado, the whole avocado, and try to capture some of that what looks to me like broken color across the seed of the avocado half that's open. So um, a lot of our time will be spent in those areas. So the drawing, when we start the clock, you know, the, the initial pencil drawing, I'm going to start with a pencil, just using our regular a regular black wing pencil. Um, that won't take very long, you know, and it's okay if your our shapes are a little bit off because this is an organic subject matter. Um, but... Uh, Uh, We want to get to the color and value as quickly as we can. So do your best, and I'll do my best with our overall shapes. Um, I may also draw the avocados slightly lower in the picture plane. You know, there's, there's more space at the bottom of the composition, empty space, than there is at the top of the composition over the avocado that's whole. So I might move them down a little bit in the composition. We'll just see where they land. 
I guess that's it. I think we're, uh, I do have a stump, by the way. I didn't mention that, but you may have seen it in my tray. And I even have some paper towels in case I want to do a little bit of old school paper towel work on there. We'll see. And they, or I might just use them to, to wipe my forehead as the clock um, dwindles down. So speaking of the clock, let's You're go ahead ready? and bring that up. Yep. All right, we're going to bring up the timer, 45 minutes. And I'll try to produce a drawing in 45 minutes. <laughs> produce a drawing. <laughs> ah. All right. Um, all right. As you're starting the drawing, we've got uh, London, Ontario, Canada, Northern Indiana, Northwest Indiana, Chicago, uh, 40 kilometers south of Knights of Lavender. Wow, that's a place. That sounds wonderful. Malaysia, Scotland, Norway, Texas, North Wales, Australia, New York City, Scotland, Arizona, from everywhere. British Columbia, Canada, Cape Cod. Thanks for joining us, guys. From all over the world, wherever you are, thanks so much. Yep. It's easy for us here. It's, you know, it's 6.30 p.m. in the afternoon. We got another show after this, though, so it's not that easy. It's That's easy right. As far as the time goes, easy to, easy for us to make it. Right, but for some of you, it is either the wee hours of the morning or really late at night, and we just appreciate you being with mm -hmm. us here. Uh, Kansas, All right. Michigan, Ohio. Now, um, an avocado is—is is it a fruit? Uh, it's got a seed, so I guess it's a uh, fruit. Now, vegetables don't have seeds. And of course, I'm not great at are, identifying are, uh, plant, uh, fruits and vegetables and what constitutes one over the now, other. But I think see, vegetables don't have seeds. Are vegetables the root? Like some of them are. Like a carrot is the root, right? right? Well, a co corn is not no. a root. Corn is, are those seeds? The, the kernels, the, the, listen, the kernels this is, count as seeds? This is, we are letting you know how intelligent we are. <laughs> I should have really not mean, picked a farming really. theme. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, you're an expert farmer, right? But, you know, avocados. No, I do have a don't garden. all avocados come from Mexico? Um, most of them do <laughs> in our country. You know, North Americans eat so many avocados. If you guys, any of you that aren't from North America... Um, we had an avocado shortage recently. The price went up, and everybody was losing their minds. I didn't notice it. We still ate avocados. Okay. Well, we did too. I yeah. think we were probably just paying more. But I don't. Yeah. I don't know. I don't do the grocery shopping. Um, my, my wife does the grocery shopping, so that uh, because I don't do a good job. Did they? Apparently, not? I leave out one ingredient for everything we need to cook, and we have to go back to the grocery store. So <laughs> <laughs> now um, there is a, an old book that my my mom used to read to me. Um, about a man who could not read and uh, was sent to the grocery store to buy groceries. Oh, wow. And of course, he bought all the wrong groceries because <laughs> he couldn't read, you know? Yeah. Um, he just went on looking at the pictures. Based on color groceries. and pictures, yeah. yeah. That's how I. That's probably how I shop. And, uh, yeah, that made me think of that. But I like the color of this package. But also my wife will go buy stuff sometimes and, and buy the incorrect things, you know. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I wonder if she's just looking at the pictures. <laughs> Her too. I'm just kidding. Her but uh, sometimes she does buy things that that uh, are unusual or unusable because, you know, it was written on the label. It was very clear, but... Just didn't read it. Just didn't read it. Just I mean, read, you know. Yeah. Oh, anyway. Well. Um, That's how you learn to try new things, I guess. So you're starting with some looser lines yeah, there. Yeah, I pretty much got my hard lines in. Mm -hmm. I left a gap here because the visual information isn't clear. It's just a really dark area. I mean, I think we could probably make it up. I'm sure this is probably about what that does. But we're going to lose it anyway because it's going to get so dark in there. So you can draw that part in or leave it out. Um, I mostly just use the edge of the picture plane, just the gaps from the edge of the picture plane on the left and right to lay this out. I'm not sure if I ended up drawing it closer to the bottom of the picture plane um, than in the reference. It's maybe a little bit closer to the bottom than, uh, than in the reference, but it feels, feels pretty good. It feels okay to me. So I think I'm going to go ahead and move on 
And um, there may be uh, some differences. I think this might be a little deeper or thicker. Well, maybe I'll change it a little bit. Well, but we're going to move to the color, uh, the color application in just a moment. I think you have a good balance between the positive and negative space within your picture plane. So yeah. even if it's not the same as the reference, that's not a big. It, as long as it looks good then it is good, even if it doesn't match the reference exactly. And in so. this case, it's got to taste good, it's too. It's got to taste uh, good. Jan says the avocado is a tree that has a fruit that is botanically, botanically a mm -hmm. berry. It's a berry? Okay. It is a okay. berry. I can believe that because I've, get, I've always had trouble with what's a berry. I know. What is the deal with that? I mean, why, They've got why seeds so too, confusing? you know, and but and, I, I learned a few years ago, or maybe I don't know, sometime in my adult life, that strawberries aren't berries because their seeds are on the outside. Apparently, that makes a difference. And why aren't strawberries fruit? You know, I don't. I don't. They're brambles. Brambles. Yeah, I know it's getting complicated. That's another type of. Are strawberries not a berry? No, it's a bramble because brambles have their seeds on the outside. Oh my gosh. So it's a it's it's like incorrectly or mis no it's a misnomer. It's not named right. But anyway, um I think it's now let's see. I think we're gonna go ahead and begin. Uh, Matt's got me thinking about what's a berry and what's not a berry, <laughs> and I'm totally distracted right now. So I'm let's, sorry. let's I'm talk sorry. let's get into the pastels. I'm gonna go ahead and start with a little bit of black in the darkest area. We'll be using black tonight and I'll be working some green into there. And um, what is interesting to me about this subject is the texture on the skin of the avocado. We can see a little bit of the texture in the darkness way down here at the very bottom of our half of avocado. So I just want to point that out. Be careful. We don't want to, we don't want to um, d d totally cover that in black. So now are you going to leave any areas that are stark black? Or are you going to add... A little bit of color. I'm going to still work into here with some green, but I'm not yeah. sure if it'll show up. You can see that I'm, you know, leaving some paper exposed um, so that there's still plenty of tooth on the page to grab the next color. And I'm going to try to, the intention here is to totally um, develop the form of the avocado without the bumps. So we're going to look through the bumps and try to see the colors or the values and colors of green that are in the avocado, and then go back and add the texture. You know, I like so to think make of... make a smooth avocado. Yeah, make, make a smooth... We're going to improve this avocado. We're going to smooth them out. No, it's not an improvement, but uh, we're going to simplify it at first and then kind of get into the texture after that. Maybe just a touch over here, just a touch of black over there. All right, a little bit more down here. We'll switch to a green. Well, I love the looseness in which you're starting this drawing. I think... Uh, for a lot of folks, they start drawing and they kind of tense up. Feel oh, the yeah. muscles get well, real I'm tight. Well, I'm tense on the inside. So. They're afraid they're going to mess something up. But, uh, you know, you're, you're working with a, kind of a, a looser mark. And it looks like you're moving your whole arm when you're making marks. Yeah, pretty much moving from the shoulder as much as I can. I mean, it's kind of a small drawing. So we'll work a little bit of green in here. Um, and, of course, you know, I think it's showing up as green. So it's going to have to be darker again. We'll add some more black in here, too. But this green is too light um, for this area on its own. And that's why uh, I steer clear of pastels a lot because the color <laughs> selection is limited. And I like to work with a limited palette, but with a limited painting palette, I can still make all the different colors, right? Well, with limited uh, pastel palette, um, I'm just going to have to settle for colors or work into more of a wet and to wet way. That's kind of how I approach pastels. You know, we're just kind of layering and mixing on the surface. So I think about pastel work as sort of like wet and to wet painting. Yeah, it's, it's, your pastels are kind of designed to be layered. Yeah. And the more layers you put on, the more depth you have in the color. Um, as long as the tooth of the paper will allow it, that's why right. it's important to work on a paper that has some texture when you're working with pastels. If you try to work with pastels on smooth drawing paper, then um, the, it's gonna get real dusty. The, the pastels are gonna blow around. It's gonna be hard to keep the pastels in place on the paper. And you're also gonna be limited to the number of layers that you can add. Now I'm working on the smoother side, so, um, and only because this is a, a fast drawing. It's a 45 minute drawing. So 
I don't think I'll have time to uh, fill up the tooth entirely. So we should be okay. We should be good. All right, I'm working with a pencil right now, a pastel pencil, just checking out the colors. I've got a couple of different greens, and they're a little hard to recognize. So, Some of the pencils you have to be careful with um, because they can they can actually flatten the tooth. Yeah, they can destroy the tooth Yeah, and a then, little bit. Then you're not able to put any pastels on the surface after that. So you have to be careful. And that color was... Dark enough, but it was a little too cool, so I'm going to steer clear of it anyway. What's interesting is on on camera, when you bring the, the actual pastel stick of that green you just added, mm -hmm. it looked minty green. Yeah. And then when you made a mark, it was more of a yellow green, so. Well, I don't know if it's the camera. It's probably just me. Yeah. <laughs> So right, a little bit a, of blue in there, too? That's a little bit. Yeah, I'm just trying to cool it down and darken it a little mm -hmm. bit because the color is just too light for this area without any blue in there. So, all right, and there is that super, super light um, minty green that's in the middle behind all those bumps, you know, where the light is hitting the strongest. That's where we're going to get most of our texture. Matthew says, tonight's drawing's off to a great start. All right. Well, thank I you, agree. Matthew. That's great. Um, Michelle says, I enjoy watching the different styles of drawing that you each do. Thank you for that. The black really comes pretty far over behind those bumps. You know, if you look at the, the bumps on the avocado, kind of uh, right through the middle of the avocado, where right to the, or to the right of the highlight, um, it's still pretty dark or pretty black, nearly black behind that area. So mm -hmm. I'm still going to add a little bit more in there. I'm going to have to blow some pastel today. So Now, one thing that kind of uh, deters people from using pastels is kind of a perception that they're hard to control. Mm -hmm. um, and we can see around the outer edges of the avocado that the pastel is rough and oh, yeah. it's kind of smeary but you have a plan for that don't you well i haven't done the background yet you right. know, or, or even uh you know I'm kind of leaving it out until we get a lot of the colors in place um not the texture just some of the colors and then we can go back in and work uh work on our contours with our background color kind of using it almost like a an eraser All right, so we've got a very light green here in the middle now. And there will be a lot of that will be our uh, textured area. Just trying to soften these a little bit. May even start to hint at the texture even now with some of these uh, blended marks. Yeah, absolutely. You're already seeing the form of... Right, form's the most important. You know, form and value are way, way more important than texture every time. So if we can get that in place, then we'll do as well as we can with the texture. But I like to think of texture. I've said it before, as icing on a cake. Um, it's sort of a superficial, you know, surface treatment. And we ice, it, we ice our cakes at the end after we've baked them. And so I like to ice my drawings with texture at the end also. All right, Shane has an interesting question. They ask, what subjects do you guys usually sketch in your everyday sketchbooks? Uh, I Actually, more figure drawing and things like that. Mm -hmm. Things that I don't do very often here on Getting Sketchy. Um, I wish that I sketched every day in a sketchbook. Um, but what I'm doing most days is creating a finished piece of art or editing video um, or helping you guys out in one way or the other or making more videos so um you make a lot more finished art yeah. actually nowadays than than sketchbook art right yes where so, you might would be doing more planning and practicing exactly so most of the work i do is is in fact all the work i do these days is uh, finished works of art you know some are a little bit looser than others and some are a little bit quicker than others um I do sketch from time to time, um, but you, usually it's not in a sketchbook. Usually it's just on a loose sheet of paper when I'm trying to plan things out. Um, 
that's probably not the best practice. Probably would be better if I had a, a dedicated sketchbook. But I do have right here behind me, I have about five or six sketchbooks that are filled up with uh, know, other I, other. I drawings. prefer to work on loose paper. Yeah, really, me too. I, then I, I just, usually take the paper out of a sketchbook yeah. and then sketch on that paper. And then when I'm done, I actually throw the sketch away. I usually clean up everything and... I'm usually just testing like materials. Yeah, experimenting, experimentation, and practice are part of the artistic process. Not mm -hmm. so, and a lot right. of times sketchbooks don't have something precious in there, but a page that you learned something from. Yeah, so I'm not really studying subjects like I used to when I was a student, um, and I'm, I don't want to sound pretentious there. I'm all of us are students; we're all still learning. Um, but I just, I guess I approach doing sketches a little different than I did um, when I was a younger artist, we'll, we'll say mm -hmm. that. <laughs> well, you know, um, it, my students mentioned to me the idea of doing, what, oh, what did they call it? It's like a sketchbook walkthrough or something like that, mm -hmm. you know, where you show your sketchbooks um, on YouTube or whatever. And I thought I could do that. I would just have to get all my loose papers together you know, and bind them together or put them in a folder. And, uh, and it would kind of count. My yeah. understanding is that a lot of um, Leonardo da Vinci's sketches were on, you know, on loose paper. And we say his sketchbook, but it's really just an assembled grouping of drawings. All right. Uh, so I've used some yellow and some white in here for the most part. I'm going to put some more yellow in there now. Yeah, that's, I think right now, before you add that yellow, I know I'm taking away from your time, no, go but ahead. I want people to see how white can make things look kind of muted and mm -hmm. unnatural. White and black are colors that you have to be kind of careful yeah, with. Yeah, they, 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 the, they kill the light in a little, a little bit of ways, you know, because color is revealed by light, so too much of those. I like to think of white and black as gray. <laughs> they really are the extremes of gray. Gray is, uh, of course, the epitome of colorlessness and then with the addition of that yellow there now you've got a light yellow green yeah you're trying to get that, that there. trying to get that heat back in there a little bit of course we'll get our colors as close as we can um, given that uh, we may be working with a limited pastel choices uh orion nebula says are those oil or chalk based pastels chalk based yeah right there. um typically when you're Talking about pastels, the chalkier feeling pastels are typically referred to as soft pastels. Mm -hmm. And oil pastels are obviously referred to as oil pastels. Um, and then there are hard pastels, which actually has some hard pastels there too, which are new pastels. They're, the brand name is new, N-U pastels. But still, they're still chalk-like. They're still chalk-like. They're just less chalky than the soft pastels. Um, but they're great for deliberate marks. I mean, you can think of like Prismacolor very thin pencils or yes. harder pencils, and Prismacolor Premier pencils or softer pencils. That's kind of the same thing. Or I've, it's not the same thing, but it's a, a good comparison. You know, I've got a lot of those very thins right now in my classroom, mm -hmm. and we're just loving them. You like them for yeah. details, maybe? Yeah, they're great. Um, and we do use them in combination with softer, oh, yeah, yeah, softer yeah. ones. They've been great. Um, now, oil pastels are so extremely different from soft pastels that I really think it's kind of unfair that they're called pastels, actually. Um, because they should be called painting sticks because they're more, it's more like partially dried oil paint in a stick form to me. Yeah, oil pastels are, uh, the, the way you use them is actually different than how you use soft pastels. Mm -hmm. um, but as Orion Nebula, I know you know this, there is a uh, oil pastel course that I just recently re released over at thevirtualinstructor.com. So uh, if you haven't been exposed to oil pastels, that is a great course to go through. And, uh, we talk about all the methods or a lot of the methods that you can use to create oil pastel drawings, of course. Now, if you're use, you could use oil pastels for this drawing tonight. Yeah, absolutely. For sure. Don't yeah. think you can't use them. In fact, I love oil pastels. Yeah, I really like oil pastels, too. And are, I, I like uh, all forms of pastel. Mm -hmm. it, it helps me to loosen up a little bit and not be so stiff. Just throwing a little bit of, just a little bit of black where there's some darker areas, kind of in the corners. It's kind of like a reverse vignette here. It gets a little darker around the corners. Of course, this image came from Pixabay. Um, 
and it's copyright free imagery. It was not a square. I edited it a little bit to make it a square. Um, I think it works better as a square than the rectangle that it was uh, originally in. Plus, um, squares and verticals work better on getting sketchy just because of the format of your own screen. So try to do that when I can. All right. Now, I see a little bit. I want to get back into these um, pretty soon. Actually, I need to get back there really fast. But there's some similarities between the colors in the background and the base color of this seed. So I'm going to go ahead and work on the background and some of this huge seed a little bit. And I see these as being sort of red-violet. You know, I know it's brown. You know, it's brown in, the, in there. But if it had to be a color, if I had to name the color that I see in this spot on the seed, I would probably say red-violet or leaning closer to red. So I'm going to start with some red and purple, and then we'll tone all that down where necessary with neutral colors. So don't, you know, I haven't lost my mind, but I am going to put some, some purple in here, all right, even though you may not really see it. So when, we work, when I work with pastel, you know, or, or paint, you know, we do the same thing with a, when we're mixing paint. We're really doing an analysis of the colors that we see, you know, not always trying to find the, just the very right pastel or the right paint tube, but the right collection of pastels or paint tubes that we might be able to put together. A little bit of color analysis. And if my background is different or a little bit more colorful, um, I'm cool with that. I like to try to see the color through and in the neutrals when I can. All right, so we'll get a little bit of the red over that. And this is super bright up against the greens, at least it is to me. It's because of the somewhat complementary contrast, complementary relationship there. All right, um, yeah, I love the colors you're using in the background. Uh, that's really making those green avocados pop. Yeah. Um, Jan says oil pastels are so much fun and makes the art process less intimidating, I think, but alas, it is not archival. Um, I'm not sure about the not archival part of that, uh, Jan. Um, they, they are delicate, Yeah, for sure. I know some, some colors will, will fade over time. But um, I'm not totally sure that they're not. If you or if you're using a professional level oil pastel, and they, they do exist, you know, p pigment rich, professional quality oil pastels. The student grade oil pastels, whatever that means, you know, but student grade oil pastels are very cheap. You know, you get like a set of a box of like twenty four for three or four dollars. But the artist quality pastels are quite a bit more expensive. Yeah, I use Sennelier oil pastels. I also use uh, other brands too, like Craypot, which are much more less expensive. Yeah. But the Sennelier oil pastels are extremely expensive. Um, they're, in fact, some of the most expensive materials that I purchase. And um, so I'm they'll, glad to they're pay not gonna that fade. price yeah. because they are such high quality oil pastels. And um, in just a minute, I might reach around here and see if, if it says that they're archival on there because I would hate to turn anybody away from oil pastels uh, just because they think that they're not going to last. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see. Uh, a question from Cynthia says, do oil pastels have an odor similar to oil paints? Not at all. Nope. They have a very faint odor, but you'd have to stick it near your nose to smell it. And then you're, then you're getting close to your nose. You might make it hard. <laughs> so it's I wouldn't a different oil there. anyway. <laughs> you know, the oil pastels are made with a vegetable oil of some sort, you know, um, that doesn't dry, and linseed oil is the typical binder in oil paint, sometimes walnut oil, but usually linseed oil. Uh, a scarf and tea asks, how do you store oil pastel drawings? Um, I use cover sheets over the top of my oil pastel drawings, and I, I store them in a drawer until I'm ready to, to frame them. If you haven't seen my video on how to store artwork, you can look it up on YouTube. I go through uh, how I store all different types of artworks, uh, colored pencil drawings, pen and ink, and so on. And that should give you some good ideas on how you store drawings, because you can store different types of drawings in different ways. For example, the way you store a colored pencil drawing is going to be a little bit different than you, how you store a soft pastel drawing, obviously. Oliver Long asks, have you ever used pastel pencils before? And if so, what do you think about them? I, I think that might be directed at you. Well, um, I do use pastel pencils some, um, but just for details usually. They're usually kind of hard. I have some here tonight. We're going to be using them right here. So um, there is a brand of, of, of pastel pencils that I really like, and the, 
they're bigger. They're like the barrel or diameter of the pencil is larger. Who makes those, Matt? Do you remember? I'm sorry, say that again? They're the pastel pencils that are large in diameter. Conte Aperit. That's it. Yeah. yeah. Those are great um, pastel pencils. Better than what I'm using tonight, which are the General's brand. And I'm looking on my Sennelier box of oil pastels. I have a 72 color set here. And I can't find anything about them being archival. There's actually no m mention of them actually being acid free either. So Interesting. But I'm pretty sure that they are. Well, they're, they should be because they really should. For their be, very yeah. cost, it would seem to indicate as much. Yeah, the cost of these are. Uh, the cost of these oil pastels, it's a little bit jarring. <laughs> yeah. Expensive they are because they're so soft that you go through a color pretty quickly. I love that bit of yellow and orange that's happening. Back yeah, I'm getting there into too. the background, yeah. but uh, I'm really getting into the background and the t time's just ticking away. So and, I'm going to. Well, I really like it. I think this is a good, good example of why you really need to layer oil pastels when you use them you know you're you're the more layers you put on the more interest that's there is right in drawing. Yeah, that's right that's true All right. how do you frame oil pastels ask Veek. well you would frame oil pastels like you would frame uh, a soft pastel drawing you want to make sure that there's a little bit of space between the actual art and the glass if yeah. you put it behind glass um, so you want to use a mat around the artwork so that provides a little bit of a barrier between the oil pastel material and the glass. Um, you just want to have a little bit of space there. And with oil pastel, since you can build up the texture in kind of an impasto uh, way, meaning that you can put really thick applications on, um, you want to make sure that that mat extends out beyond any impasto applications. You just don't want that oil pastel sticking up against the glass. So it's nothing, nothing real fancy, uh, nothing super special you have to do. Now, um, we have used wax over our oil pastels before to help protect them. Floor wax, just painted it on and a couple of layers so that there's um, a waxy barrier just to prevent the oil pastel from kind of getting scratched. So that's a thought. Uh, Ernest says, Matt, have you ever tried making your own pastels? No, but I would really love to do that. That actually is not a bad idea. Yeah, maybe we've I'll, talked about I'll it. I'll try doing that soon. Yeah, we've talked about ordering the supplies, you know. Um, let's see. Margaret says, Ashley did that great cat in oil pastels. Oh, that's right. And then Buddy says, and Matt did one in soft pastels. Great, we, too. We should yeah. probably, um, oil pastels need to make an appearance again. Pretty well, soon. oil pastels are one of my favorite mediums, so I'm sure in the next season. I mean, it, you know, I, you know how much I like to have variety. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and do so this season working with the same combination of media uh, killed me a little bit. Yeah, so it that's right. I, I bet inside. it was hard for you going. You know, <laughs> even though it's a great combination, and you're actually still using it. I still use. Yes, st but they don't know that video is coming. That's right. Yeah. That's right. So um, you may need a break. Yeah, that video won't come out for a few weeks, actually. All right. <clears throat> Just looking at my choices a little bit here. Uh, Andrea asked, do you have any fixatives that you re recommend for oil and or soft pastels? Well, you don't want to put regular fixative on, on oil pastel drawing. Mm -hmm. Ashley said that they use floor wax in his classroom. Of course, it's an it's industrial product. It's not from an art store. It's not archival. But it does protect the oil pastels. And, you know, I've seen oil pastels that were done probably six or seven years ago with some floor wax on them, and they still look good. So use at your own risk there. Um, but as far as soft pastels, there are a lot of uh, great uh, fixatives out there um, by the major brands. Uh, I don't use fixative anymore. I used to fix my artworks. Now I don't because uh, it does create a slight change in values. And I actually have a really old post on that. Uh, so it does change the color to a certain degree. And I've also noticed that uh, if you're not careful with the spray, if you're using a spray mm -hmm. fixative, it can splatter on your artwork. And I just really don't want to take that risk. Most yeah. of the artworks I do are stored away and protected or they're framed. Uh, so I don't really have to worry about, you know, 
putting them in a portfolio or shoving them around. Yeah, it's funny around. you mention that. I was reading the requirements for the AP portfolios for this year, you know, my, for my students. We were going over them. And for the artworks that they submit physically, you know, the ones they send in, it's re- it said it's required that you, if they're, you know, dusty like charcoal or pastel that you spray them with a fixative. They have to physically send in the artworks? Yes. We've gone back to that. You know, Why? we stopped Are physically sending that? in artwork during the coronavirus years. And I, I thought, thought they, I thought, well, that's it. We'll never physically send the artwork in again. I thought and they now did they're requesting the artwork. Photographs. We, we, um, we, we, have, we upload the artwork digitally yeah. to, you know, a really great online portfolio. And then we pick the best five, which are already, you know, uploaded digitally. And, um, and we send them in. Well, that stinks. Yeah, I, I, it really does. Yeah, my students are pretty in. upset about it too, because they've grown up in this world of sharing digital images, you yeah. know, and they don't really understand why they need to do that, and they're worried about their artwork not coming back, right. you know, things like that. Understandably so. That's... And, and there's even a disclaimer that, that says that AP is not responsible for artwork that's damaged or lost. That it doesn't happen often, but accidents do happen. So they're like, well, I don't want to send my best pieces in. And what if they get lost? Mm-hmm. So anyway, I had to to fight that battle a little bit today in the classroom. Okay, GP points out that Sennelier produces an oil pastels fixative. Yeah, I have seen that. I've never used it, um, but since they're making it, it's probably just fine. But also exists a uh, gloss varnish as well. It depends on the effects of the final varnish that a painter wants to create for each technique, even oil, gouache, acrylic, etc. Um, let's see. All right, we're trying to put some broken color on this seed right now. You know, I went pretty dark in there, and now I've got a very light pastel. It's not totally white. You know, this square stick is white, so you can see I've got sort of an off-white color, but you could use white just the same. And I'm just trying to work some over with a really light touch so that the darker color is able to peep through. And, of course, it's going to need to be built up. There's some areas where not much of that dark color peeps through, but just the intention here is to let some of the darker color show through on the seed. Um, Edie says, I found the spray fixative can blow away some of the color particles. Yeah, it can. That's why you should, you know, hold it really far away and just let the pastel, um, I'm sorry, let the fixative kind of fall on it. You know, hold it, I don't know what the bottle says, but at least 18 inches, maybe 24 inches away. Or you could put a cover sheet on it and put it in a drawer. Yeah, you could do that. (laughs) Or just get it in a, you know, get it in a frame and hang it up and uh, it'll be safe. Um, thanks for your comment there, Renee. I yeah. see that. Thank you. Um, yeah. Just all right. It's going to slow down now because we're working on some of the texture. And thanks for your comment, buddy. You know, texture is always a problem to solve. You know, every, I mean, if we, if I were to draw this avocado tomorrow or a different avocado, it would still be a little bit different of an experience. So you just have to take your time, do a lot of hard observation, you know, really look at your reference often and, uh, and, and figure out how to move your hand to make marks that are going to translate into one specific texture and, uh, and it probably only good for that texture. The next time you have a texture to solve, you'll have to use a different mark, different type of mark making, specific to that subject. So I, um, it's my least favorite element of art, texture. We don't get along very well. <laughs> well, uh, texture is so dependent, in my opinion, on directional stroke making and value. And value, value. fast changes between value. That's right. That's right. So we're about to get to the you know, this part of the avocado where we're going to have a lot of those fast little changes. Yeah, Javi Jav says, love avocados in general. I do too. I really love avocados. I eat avocados all the time. Um, and they say, I have to say that this one looks good enough to eat. Mm. Just need a little salt and cracked pepper. That's yeah, how I like to eat them. a little bit them. more than that because uh, that would be <laughs> really dusty and uh, that paper would be hard to get down without some <laughs> water. Even... Uh, even uh, salt could make even this piece of paper taste pretty good. All right, now I'm using the pencil to find some of those harder 
sharper, oh, I probably over, overdid it a little bit, but sharper, darker marks, at, really almost like accents around the edge of our avocado. So, and there's a... He man. says, it looks like a work of art, referring to your drawing, thank, as opposed oh. to a realist copy. And yeah, that's, that's kind of what we're going for. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Ernest says, Ashley, what grade do you teach at school? High schools, high school. So nine through 12. So what that means is um, he has students, all, all the students, not all the students, but uh, students are from all ages. Yeah, pretty much from 14 to 18 or 19 or 20, but ideally 14 to 18 is the age group. And this is at a magnet high school for visual arts and performing arts. Mm -hmm. So this, the, the, the classes are specialized, too. So there's instead of having art one, art two, or, or art three, um, there are painting classes, drawing classes, right. yeah, kids digital Kids are signing up classes. specifically for um, ceramics or specifically for oil painting or specifically right. for digital art as opposed to general art, general ed art classes. Okay. Can't leave this guy alone here. And when I taught high school, it's the same high school I taught at too. Mm -hmm. And in fact, I liked that high school so much that I named my fourth daughter yeah. after the high school, believe it or not. Good times. Well, actually, my third daughter, fourth child. Yeah, you better get that <laughs> I right. Specify <laughs> that I have only four children, not five. <laughs> Jen says that sounds like a challenging age group. You know, they um, are this year. Yeah, whole the ninth graders have been off me. the chain this year. But you got to remember, they practically missed middle school because of coronavirus, and a lot of the socialization and realizations that happen in middle school about getting along with others and and. Uh, um, having a general respect for your peers, not just your teachers, but just the people around you. They missed all those lessons. They were behind a computer screen, and they, they may have been exposed to their math and science, but they missed some of that other stuff. Um, we're talking about self-discipline and discipline, and, uh, and they're really suffering for it. It's kind of sad to watch. And Jen, I'll just add that every age group has its own challenges and own advantages because I, I was fortunate to do my student teaching in an elementary school and a middle school, and then I spent the time I was teaching in a high school. And then when I was at central office, I was dealing with adults, oh, which yeah. is not the fun group. Um, but <laughs> <laughs> uh, the, the elementary kids are, you know, they're not going to challenge you as far as art creation, uh, but they are so creative and so fun and so energetic, and you're so much bigger than them that you can scare yeah. them. And uh, you see them like their <laughs> their faces light up when something looks good. You know, yeah, they have yeah, positive yeah. attitudes about the work that they're doing. They're trying really hard because no one's shut them down yet. You know, it, about their drawing ability or anything like that. So uh, the middle school kids. You know, they can produce some fairly high-quality artwork if you're doing a good job as a teacher. Uh, but they're still at that age where, um, you know, they'll listen to what you say. And for the most part, they'll follow directions and not be too disruptive. But middle school kids are also, in my opinion, the meanest human beings on the planet. <laughs> they're mostly mean to each other. That's and, true. Uh, they're also awkward, you know. So uh, it takes a special person to teach Well, and school. that's what I mean. Our ninth graders are still behaving that way a little bit. You know, they're just still kind of not empathetic yet. So. But I tell you, I loved middle school when I when I student taught there. Um, and high school students are, you know, they produce the highest level of art. But oh, then yeah. you're dealing with uh, empathy or not empathy. Uh, you're dealing with issues on what's the word I'm looking for? They're very lethargic. I think is the apathy. Word I'm looking. Apathy. Apathy. That's what not I'm empathy. They're, they're apathy. very apathetic. Right. They're definitely not empathetic. They're <laughs> apathetic um and that can be a challenge sometimes uh but you know it's your job to get them excited about what they're creating or what they're doing and if you're a teacher and you're watching this and your students are not excited about coming to your class then there are some things that you need to do differently um i know and i'm kind of getting on a soapbox here but if you're an art teacher and your students don't enjoy coming to your class then sometimes that's not their fault sometimes that's your fault um and 
you need to think about what you can do to make your class more exciting. That doesn't mean throw the rules out the window. It, it doesn't mean you have to be an entertainer. Right, exactly. You know? Just make it more exciting for them to be engaged in. Uh, Michelle says that looks amazing so far. It's starting to happen, and we've got some white speckles that are going to go around in this sort of zone um, that will hopefully pull, you know, pull all this texture together. Um, Buddy says, Matt, how old are the high school students? Um, I guess that would need to be explained because school systems are different in different countries. Yeah. And I believe Buddy's in Germany. Uh, high school is, uh, let's see, they're 14. 14 to 18, 14 ideally. To 18. Yeah. And some students, you know, are getting up to 19 and 20 sometimes right. if they've been held back. And or, occasionally we'll have student graduate at 17 because they started early or they skipped ahead a little bit. It's possible in some school systems. Okay, Abdi, Abhi, maybe, I, I think I'm, I might be mispronouncing it. it. says, Matt, this is wonderful. Is underpainting necessary for pastel painting? Well, this is actually creating the drawing right now. Mm -hmm. I'm getting to do the talking tonight. Yeah. Uh, and uh, Ashley is doing a wonderful job. But an underpainting is not necessary for pastel painting. It's, no. you know, just like with acrylic painting, um, you could do an underpainting if you want and then glaze over the top or apply solid applications over the top. Or you can paint directly uh, where you're not using an underpainting. And the same thing's true for pastels. You can create an underpainting if you want of, of neutral values and go over the top of it. Those colors are gonna mix a little bit when you layer over the top, but unlike an acrylic painting. Um, or you can draw or paint directly. Um, actually, he started with some black Mm -hmm. And then went over the top of it. I wouldn't consider that a true underpainting. I would just no. consider that layering, yeah. which is crucial for pastel painting. So if you're asking, is layering necessary for pastel painting? It's not necessary to create a pastel painting, but it is necessary, in my opinion, for success uh, in creating a pastel painting. Yeah, they're intended to be layered, just like um, similarly, I guess, to colored pencils. Kind of build them up. All right, so just going back and forth between um, light marks and dark marks. Matt mentioned that texture is created by changes in value. And so I've got, uh, got my pencils in my hand. I've got, actually got a white charcoal pencil right now and then a dark green pencil. So I'm just going back and forth with those lighter and darker marks and just kind of working my way um, outward. And Earn this is a drawing that I think I could work on for several more hours. Yeah, you definitely could. Uh, but it looks good in its current state. Too. It's, 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 you know, it's, I think it's okay. I mean, I think it's good for a sketch. You know, it's turned into a good sketch, but there's just so much going on in here. You know, I would love to get my face right down there and, uh, and just spend some hours in here. Now, I've switched to a yellow um, just for some variety. Maybe a really light green would be more appropriate. Some of these little light marks, as we get further from the highlight, are not as white. So I just want to be careful and sensitive to that. I'll Ernest says, two my, minutes to get dark. My brother teaches in Japan and art is so structured. And you you would find, Ernest, that some teachers and some programs in this country have structured art programs. Mm -hmm. uh, our program was very structured. Right. Um, we and, believe there's an actual method, you know, to, to, to learn an art. There's an order to it. It's not so random. There, trust me, there are lots of programs that aren't structured, and sometimes you wonder what the art teacher is doing. Yeah. Um, that was... Anyway, um, I have witnessed that, um, and uh, art should be structured. Art should be structured in the same way as a math class because we learn things in a progressive way and a good art teacher is going to know yeah. that we need to build on concepts in order for students to, to grasp those concepts and really learn them in depth so there needs to be structure there just like in math we learn uh, addition before we learn subtraction it would be really hard to learn subtraction before addition it would seem backwards it would be backwards yet yeah, I see so many art teachers, or I did see so many art teachers, start the year off with color theory. And that makes no sense at all <laughs> to go right into painting and color right at the beginning of the year. Yeah. Uh, you've got to work your way into that. You need to start, in my opinion, with line, then move on to shape, then form, 
and value um, and texture, and you eventually get to color theory after you've talked about value at least, after you've taught value up and down. Um, so I think even after having art classes through high school, some, um, when I went to college, the first year we didn't work with color at all. It was all about value for a year. You know, I, I like the texture that has developed on that seed there. Thank you. Oh, I think I, oh gosh, my it's time's a lot smoother. Almost up. And more uh, representational there. Here on this seat, on the seat? Yeah, it's yeah. the only seat mm -hmm. in there. I've been touching it a little bit yeah. just, just to incorporate some of those marks. And that bit of blue up there is, is good too that you up in here? noticed. At the top, on the top edge. Of the, the, of the seed? Of the seed, yeah. Yeah, I do yeah. have some blue specks and such in there. So yeah, well, it's in you, the reference. I'm glad you noticed. Yeah, there. yeah there, it is there. It's yeah. right there. You can see the blue a little bit in there. So, all right. Just going to I could just change these colors in the background forever. Okay, a couple of things real quick here as you're finishing up. Mm -hmm. um, Buddy says, speaking of layering, I thought I just finished parts of a piece I'm working on. Then I started the, the next round for some details and couldn't stop layering. Yeah, that often happens. <laughs> uh, Shane says, at which age would you, would you guys have considered yourself professionals or maybe masters? And I'll answer that first, and I'll let uh, Ashley answer that. Okay. I would never call myself a master um, I, I feel like that would be pretentious. I'm sure there's people out there that call themselves masters. But I think I do. I, you probably actually to does. my own children <laughs> when they're when they're watching YouTube videos on how to draw. I say, "What are you doing? You've got an art master in the living room, and you're in here yeah. watching a video." That in that context, in that um, con it's a big joke. I consider myself a professional <laughs> when I get paid to make art. That's and, what I was going to say. And um, I, I was yeah. a professional before I do what I do now because I was paid for arts art pieces that I made. Um, and uh, what I do now uh, is I consider myself to be an art teacher. I'm teaching you guys and I do it professionally because I do get paid to do that. Um, and I, I think it's, I think as long as you're getting paid, then you're a professional. If you're not getting paid, you're an amateur. And um, I think we can let other people call our, us masters if they want, but I don't think we should ever call ourselves masters. That's my opinion. And I think that's the answer for most professions. You know, if you're getting paid for it, you're professional, right? So um, I have students that take commissions all the time now. It's become, it's become more popular. Kids are taking commissions and they're doing artwork for low amounts of money. So I told them, I said, you're, you know, if you're getting paid... You're working like a professional now. Doesn't mean you shouldn't go to college, but you're doing it. You're doing it. Um, a few more things here. Terry says, mm -hmm. I just read the Betty Edwards book about drawing on the right side of the brain. It's great. Yeah, I would recommend that book to everybody. That is Drawing on the Right Side of the Brain by Betty Edwards. Um, that, that book and that philosophy has uh, influenced me greatly. Um, that's why I believe anyone can draw. Let's see, Buddy says, you are so right about the concept. It took me some time to realize where to start best. Maybe she's talking about layering. She mentioned earlier about the layering. Uh, Karen, naturally art ba, says, that looks great. Thank you so much. Uh, now, Edie I says, it's beautiful. It looks like an old master's work. Oh, thank you. And Henrique says, great painting. I do like uh, the atmosphere return. we've gotten in there with all the different colors in the background. Uh, when will you return with these live streams? Next week, we will not be here. Um, mm -hmm. But the following week, we'll have a wrap-up show where we go through all the drawings we created this season. We'll talk about which ones are our favorites and which ones we we wish we'd have done a little bit differently. Right. It's, a, it's kind of a self-critique, and it's easier to be critical after we've had a few days or weeks away from our artwork. Well, the finished drawing looks absolutely fantastic. Thank and you so now much. For the most rewarding part of the process, I know. pulling I know. the tape the, off. The last time I had my work taped down with the horse, I didn't, I didn't untape it, um, you know, while we were still on air. And that's the fun part, is sharpening up those edges by peeling the tape off. So yep. I want to make sure I peel low and away, low yep. and away, yep. so I don't tear the paper. I like to tell people to pull at a 90 degree angle, and Ashley's yeah. doing that to a certain low and away, certain degree. It's pretty close. That's what to I mean by angle. away. I guess mine's a 70 degree angle. Okay. I'm still, I'm still practicing. He's, he's trying to become a master at. I'm not a off. master of peeling off the <laughs> tape. That's for sure. Oh, okay. Buddy was referring to the elements of art uh, I mentioned earlier when I was talking about uh, the structured approach to drawing. Yeah. 
Yeah. Drawing That's is, right. is a discipline like any other discipline. It, you know, some people you could probably call talented, I guess, but, um, you know, it, it's available to anyone. If you really want to draw or paint well, you can, you can do it. You just have to believe you can study and then practice just like yeah. any other discipline out there. All right. Uh, one more piece of tape. Keep sliding down the drawing board. All right. I'm pretty happy with this one. I think it went okay for um, for me. The pastel success. is always outside of my comfort zone, so that was a lot of fun. Yeah, I don't know why it is, because you're a painter. Yeah. And your pastel drawings always turn out great. I don't know. I don't it's because uh, I feel like I just always have, like, almost the right color in my hand. I just want to, you know, modify it a little bit. So, anyway, um, right. this, uh, this wraps up my season of... Down on the farm, so I think I'm going to shave my beard. I'm going to shave my beard. I've been growing it the whole season down on the farm, and I think it's all over now. And you've been growing <laughs> your beard for that reason? No, they just coincided. I noticed okay. I quit shaving when yeah. I started the down on the farm theme. It wasn't an intentional, and I just kept it going after that. Okay, Margaret reminds everyone, don't forget to hit the like button. Thanks, oh, Margaret. Yeah, please do. Um, yeah, hit the like button, everyone. I, you know, I have never really... Um, you know, encourage people to do that kind of stuff here on my channel. Um, so maybe I should start doing that. Apparently, it helps people find the video. Yeah. Uh, so helps new people find like, it, so we can share our art the, with more people. Thumbs up button there. Mm -hmm. um, amazing for 45 minutes. So yummy. Just subscribe. Thanks for that, Lily. Looks great. Uh, amazing. I hope you start the next <laughs> season soon. Uh, Jan, we'll have probably about four or five weeks off. We'll probably take a month off, and then we'll start the next season. Mm -hmm. So uh, we'll just take a little bit of break, and uh, during that time, I'll be working on other videos, still be posting videos here on YouTube, still be making, I'll still be making course content. And, we'll and still, still be doing, be the doing a lot of lessons, right. And uh, the weekly members minutes and all the things that I do uh, that aren't posted here on YouTube. Uh, you know, the YouTube is a small piece of, of what... Uh, takes place over at the virtual instructor.com. So, um, all right, let's go ahead and switch back out over here then. All right. Push the right button tonight. <laughs> all right, guys, thanks for joining us uh, for the last hour plus. Uh, I certainly enjoyed watching Ashley bring those avocados to life there. And I loved all the uh, depth and color that we saw in the background. Uh, it really made a big difference and because there are a lot of reds in that background that also contrasts with the green of the avocado too. Mm -hmm. Something that we didn't really talk about. I think maybe it was mentioned, but uh, just briefly. Um, and that, there's another look at Ashley's beard. So I wonder, is that really gonna Get be- Get a good look, it's gonna be gone. Yeah, gonna I think, changed? actually um, I'm about to go into a week off of work and what I like to do sometimes is grow a beard mm -hmm. and then spend that week shaving off pieces of it at a time so you're gonna do you need right. to take so photos. first i'm gonna do a big mustache that comes all the way down right yeah. i call it the cowboy and then we'll just start whittling away after that that's the first thing you're and gonna we'll do? stop before we get to the adolf hitler we don't go there yeah we're not gonna do that no we stop um, before we get there well actually he's definitely not gonna do that no. um but you, so my, you're gonna, are you my gonna daughter go to wants go me to start with a circle beard, you know, like a goatee. Yeah, like a goatee. So she can see what we all looked like in the '90s when we had goatees. Right. And uh, and then I'll and then I'll change that on the next day to the cowboy, right? Which is just the <laughs> like this. And I yeah. feel like I'll be honest. I what, like that. I like I it. Want but when I wear the cowboy, I feel like a big jerk. I think I treat people different. I Do talk you? to them. I just feel like a. Yeah, I feel like a little rough around the edges. I don't think I've ever seen you with the cowboy. I guess it's just for a short period of time. Maybe I should wear the cowboy <laughs> over here. Yeah, oh no, it's just for a day around the house. Yeah. I don't go out of the house with the cowboy. Yeah. But uh, maybe we should, maybe I will um, next Wednesday when we do our wrap up. Well, it won't be next Wednesday. It'll be a week after Oh, that's after right. Next I don't Wednesday. think I can wait. I'll have to show you guys pictures. Um, <laughs> and I've actually had my beard since 2002. I remember, though, you shaved it once. I, I did shave it. I've shaved it a couple of times. And you came to work, and I thought, who is that person yeah, down there wearing Matt's clothes? Some, I had some students <laughs> come back and visit me, and these students were, you know, they're kind of jokesters. Uh, one of them is an uh, animator and does, you know, you've probably seen his animation work. You just don't know it. He does animations for sports, you know, like mm -hmm. when you see the Super Bowl or whatever. Like the, the animated football players. Right, the animated right. Right. Kind of stuff. Right. Um, anyway, they came back to the classroom after I had shaved my beard and walked in 
looked at me, didn't say anything, and just started laughing and walked <laughs> out of the class. Uh, I knew immediately they were laughing because I had shaved my beard. I just shaved it the day before, just kind of as a whim, and I grew it back as quickly as I could. Another time I shaved my beard, and I didn't really shave it all the way down, but I shaved it down to where you could see my skin, uh, is when I was Batman for Halloween. Oh, yeah. Because Batman doesn't have a beard. That's right. You know, you yeah. can't have a beard and be Batman. So those are really the only two times I've done it, but I really want to have the long handlebar mustache. Oh, yes. With the wax and yes. stuff. And curl it. But my wife is totally opposed Matt, to that. Matt, so. you should do that. My my baseball coach, when I was 12, had the best handlebar mustache I've ever seen. And, you know, he was already grown out by the time I met him. Right. And I don't know what he rolled those up on every morning, but they stayed perfect circles the whole day. Well, there's wax. There's wax you put into it. Yeah. And um, I had a professor in college, one of the You still have to teachers. shape them, though. you got to roll them around yeah, something. Yeah, you shape them, but yeah. there's wax. It's the wax oh, that yeah. you put in there. Heavy wax. Uh, it's like beard wax or whatever. Mm -hmm. And you could make them... I just want them straight. You know, straight out to the side. Dolly like style. I guess it's Dolly style. He wore, he wore them out pretty straight. Yeah, I kind of thinking Three Musketeers. I, oh, I yeah. probably look totally ridiculous because I have pretty much no chin at all. But... Um, Anyway, maybe one day, <laughs> one day, probably not though, but I can dream, right? Yeah, the uh, fun part is watching it grow out, all the stages you have to go through where people right. are like, what is he doing? I'll have just, you Does know, he own a, little, a mirror? A little bit of a. <laughs> anyway, um, guys, have a great week. If you're going to be with us for the next hour, uh, we will see you there in just a minute. We're going to finish the blueberries painting. I'm excited to finish it because we've got so much covered on the surface that it really does look like a Trump Floyd painting. Now, yeah. It's really it's, it's starting to work. The eyes right, now. it's starting to work. It's and, projecting. Um, I'm really excited to get this one finished tonight. So we're going to be finishing that tonight, um, and I'm, I'm excited because I'm, I'm I have a I don't have a place picked out for it, but I, anyway, there's a surprise for tonight's lesson. Mm -hmm. um, all right. Uh, <laughs> topic next season, Jan says body yeah, hair. I saw that. Yeah. I saw Sorry about that, guys. <laughs> that would be great. We could just draw <laughs> beards the whole season. All right. Yeah. Uh, we're not going to do that, but that would be fun. All right, uh, guys, with that, we're going to go ahead and sign out for this evening and good night. <laughs>